Ishan. Okay. Uh, Ishan works for Booking.com. He traveled here from Amsterdam, and today he will uh, today he will present about uh, breaking the monolith. Um, so teach you how to break up Android applications, and give him uh, applause for coming here. Hello. Uh, am I audible in the back? Yeah, I know you guys were missing the skip ad button here, <laughs> but <laughs> with the sponsors, it's, it's usually needed. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ishan, and I came here all the way from Amsterdam. I work for Booking.com as an Android engineer, and I've been writing Android apps for about five years now. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, the topic called breaking the monolith at uh, Booking.com. So we have a gigantic app. and at some point of time, we felt like it's going out of hands and we need to do something about it. Uh, so this is the story that I'm here to uh, share with you guys. Uh, first, uh, before I dive in, can you tell me how many of you have written Android apps or are writing Android apps these days? Quite a lot of people. All right. And are you guys primarily using Java or Kotlin? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, before I dive right in, uh, I want to set some expectations uh, that you guys should have from this talk. Uh, and what I will not talk about is uh, instant apps, app bundles, or any of Jetpack things that Google promotes. September 12th. And uh, why I remember that is uh, because I just tried to find out the first commit of the repository, and it happened to be on my birthday 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating, but our code base is actually huge. And that's why we, we felt uh, that there were a lot of problems. So if I were to give you some numbers, clean build of our code took about 12 minutes. And uh, we would have to do this uh, every single time we rebased uh, from, from the master branch, or we switched branches, which were, which were like old. Or if Android Studio was like, yeah, I don't know what you've messed up with the files. I need to sync it and build it and index it. Uh, all over again. And then the incremental builds, which we call like uh, when you change some, some uh, Java line of code, uh, not a lot of files or something, or probably an XML, color changes, resource changes. This is what an incremental build is. And it took about two minutes. Now imagine a web developer sitting right next to you, the front end guy. Uh, he just changes something, hits the refresh button, and goes like, boom, this is not working. Let me iterate upon it. But for me, I need to actually make sure in my mind that this is going to work because I will have to wait two minutes just to see the changes being reflected either in the emulator or, or the mobile phone or whatever I'm trying to test upon. And I think a lot of you would, would uh, know what I'm talking about because this is the real pain of Android developers these days. Uh, and number of features started to become inversely kind of uh, uh, actually directly proportional to the build time. So more features you were adding the build times uh, would grow up. And as you know, we hate waiting for stuff as developers. So we wanted to automate or uh, improve the performance of the build times. And we started looking into what could be uh, done about this. So the simplest solution that almost everybody came up with, let's try instant run. And it's developed by Google. They have engineers working on it uh, full time, uh, optimizing the, the things for us. Uh, so let's see how it goes. It did not work, as expected. Uh, because we have custom annotation processors and, and stuff like that we, uh, that we use for our internal ORM solutions, uh, it was just not working. Like, instant run would just not work for us. So we thought, like, OK, maybe we could get rid of the custom annotation processor, and then instant run might work. But it was a lot of work. So looking at the ROI that we did not really know what it would be, we decided to ditch it. Like, let's move on to something else and probably find out what can we do. <coughs> breaking the build, there was the attempt number two. And by breaking, I actually don't mean to say Gradle build failed. But uh, after some Gradle profiling, uh, what we found out was there were two main tasks that, that consume most of the time during the build phase. It's the processing of resources and the compilation of your code. 
So uh, since we support over 40 different languages within the app, and you can actually change it at runtime, any point of time, we ship a lot of resources. So for every string, there are 40 different translations. Uh, and we have tons of strings there. And also, uh, because Android is so fragmented, we have different screens that we want to support with different assets. So you can imagine uh, how big of a, of a chunk that is for Gradle to process every single time you want to change uh, something there. So what did we do? We blew a kiss to Gradle. And how we do that is we, uh, we had the product flavors on, on diet. So what we did was we changed uh, the min SDK to 21, even though we support until 19. But we don't actively build using that every single time. And then what we did was we created a build configs uh, that would primarily target the English language, because that's what most of the developers initially would write their feature with. Or Arabic, because we also need to test RTL. And the density, we would stick to one for, for the development phase. So you're writing your feature, just build this. I don't care about all the translations and stuff. So Gradle just skips over everything, quickly does that. Uh, for those who didn't get the reference in the previous slide, cases keep it simple, silly. This thing worked, but you know how devs are. So uh, the devs were not really satisfied with the results we got because we were expecting huge gains. Of course, why not? Uh, but again, you have to wait up to two minutes still to, to get things done because Gradle can't figure out what's going on. What do I need to pick? What do I need to leave? Uh, so yeah, we just did this solution as well. Moved on to another one. Composite builds. So uh, a while ago, Gradle came up with this thing called composite builds. And uh, you know developers would go to any extent when doing research to make their lives easier. And a few, a few devs uh, there did the same. So uh, we started looking into composite builds. And uh, it, the uh, like Gradle team was uh, really saying that it's a promising thing that you could use in a project and get huge benefits out of it. Uh, this is how the project setup looked when we started integrating composite builds. So what it actually does is it breaks your project into multiple parts, uh, composite modules, I'd say. And the booking Android, which is the, the god module or, or the main app that combines everything and is shipped out to the user, uh, depends on these smaller modules like booking assistant or analytics or something like that. And then uh, they, in turn, depend on some other core services kind of things that people can share, so like commons libraries or uh, networking, localization, and things like that. Um, so how did it work is you would write your module, uh, you would compile it, and then you would use it in the booking Android by just uh, using the, the library kind of structure. and just build the app. So if, you, if, you, if you're ready with the module, just send it to the CI. It will create an artifact for you. And other developers can now start using this uh, very easily. Are you guys excited to see the results? Because this is going to be a shocking revelation. The results were amazing. Uh, and this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, yeah, we decreased the time by 33%, there by 77%, there by 77%. All right. Uh, we all can go home because it's amazing, right? Not really. Why? It is because uh, even though you saw 77% decrease in build time and we still ditched it, we, had to, we, we pissed off about 60 developers like, why are you going away with this? Well, here's the thing. Even though the main module started to build much faster, this introduced problems within the composite modules itself, which were too small. So with every new module that we would add, uh, the, the clean build time would go up by 30 seconds. Now, a very small module just handles some common utils. And we start adding new and new of these modules. And it keeps going to 30% uh, up every single time. Not happening. And then for incremental builds, it would go up by 10 seconds. Now, 10 seconds is a lot because you cannot keep scaling that thing. Because within like six more iterations or six more new modules, you're adding a minute uh, to your incremental time with the composite builds. And hence, we did not go forward with this solution. Ah, I had this. Shit. <laughs> All right. Attempt number four was JRebel. Has anybody here heard of JRebel? A lot of you guys. 
All right, so JRebel, for those who haven't heard, I'll, I'll simply describe it's a third party tool, a company writes. Uh, it, was, it used to be called Zero Turnaround, and they allow hot code reloading into your Java apps, and because Android runs on Java. So they use that technology to also power your Android apps and improve your build times. So you have an app, uh, and then you change something, you hit the JRebel play button in your Android Studio, it will hot uh, swap the code that you just changed into the app and it'll stay right there. So you would see your changes almost instantaneously. So I met these guys at a conference, saw their product, loved it, came back to Booking, uh, described this to a lot of my colleagues, and they were like, okay, sure, let's, uh, let's try this. Uh, if it works out, we just go ahead with this thing. We tried it, and we got mixed feelings about it. Why? Uh, it's because uh, it was not always working for us. Uh, again, because we had a lot of custom things going around in the code, uh, the app would just blow up from time to time. Uh, for us, it won't even compile or run on the emulator because uh, the APK will become so big because what they probably do is they have their own app in which they run, their, they run your app. So they take over the JVM, add whatever stuff they want to, and this creates a lot of other problems that they could not figure at that point of time. So it won't work for us, and we move forward. Right. Attempt number five is what you're here for, is what I'm here for, is modularization. So what did we do here? Uh, I'm sure you would have heard a lot about it. It's a big fuss nowadays uh, that we should modularize our apps. Grid modules are amazing. There's an amazing talk uh, from uh, someone at Spotify. They told uh, about how modularization helps solving their problems, also adding to their problems. So let's look into it. What is it? It's a process of breaking down a monolith into chunks, right? Now these chunks, you can imagine them as microservices, uh, like you would have on the on the back end side, but on the Android, these are very smallest parts that your app can be composed of, right? And the concept actually dates back to 1960s. So it's not something new that we just discovered and we started playing with. It's a, it's a very old concept. It's just that we started applying to the Android apps now because they're becoming huge. Yeah, I try not to bring these things there because then you look there and not here. So how? How to use it the best way? Uh, have one entry point and exit point, and then uh, establish a navigation between the screens or areas of modules. So why I'm straight away diving into screen stuff here, I will get onto that uh, very soon. But yeah, this is what I want to focus on, that if you have only one exit and entry uh, point uh, for your uh, module, it, it becomes very deterministic to test uh, the flow of the app or the modules that you have, right? And they can be tested independently because you know how the user is going to come in and you know how the user is going to go out. So if that's figured, all you need to test is the internal business logic working fine or not. Why should you modularize? Uh, for starters, it improves productivity by allowing the developers to iterate on the apps faster. And because, of course, the build times are slower and you also have slower, uh, lower uh, code that you have to deal with every single time. Because I mean, uh, I would imagine you guys work in teams, right? And not everybody does everything. So when the teams grow, people tend to shift focus from bigger areas to smaller areas and try to improve it. So imagine you have an app like Booking where you have search, filters, maps, uh, details of the property, booking, confirmation, and then post booking where you can see your confirmation, right? Not everybody is going to touch everything every single day. So you have specific developers working on specific areas. And if they only have to deal with, sorry, I'm saying shit, uh, it's much better. Because then you cannot complain. Because when you see someone else shit, you complain. You rant about it, right? And that's uh, a killer for their productivity. Uh, the build times uh, can come down to as small as uh, 10 to 20 seconds, uh, even for uh, like fairly medium amount of modules. When I compare, uh, like wrote this presentation, they were smaller, but uh, eventually they grew, and the build times are still very stable for us, right? Uh, new features. So because everything is happening in modules, thank you so much for closing the door. 
because the build times, uh, because you have smaller modules, right? Uh, now what you can do is create new features and have an entry point, an exit point, plug and play it within your app, right? You can easily replace these things because again, the entry exit thing that I was talking about. Technical debt. So like I mentioned, there's code isolation that is being offered. Uh, the possibility to reuse the code. So if someone has already fixed their shit, you can just reuse that thing in yours. Uh, and yeah, minimize the maintenance cost because there are smaller modules. You can test them easily. Uh, you don't require to change everything and maintain everything at a single point of time. You can refactor a small module. Just keep on doing that. So the layers that we initially had in mind that we would go, to, uh, we would want to see in our in our app probably a year or two down the line when we are completely modularized uh, looked something like this, right? So we have three main layers. The top one is called presentation. The second one is called app services. And the third one is called core services. The dependency flow always happens like this. So the top layer can depend on this one, but vice versa is not possible. Should never happen, ideally, right? Because again, then you're uh, ending up in the circular dependency loop, which will break stuff. Because if you want to change something in app services and it already depends on, on the layer above it, it's also going to compile that. So you always want to go from top to bottom and have uh, the dependencies flowing in one direction, right? The presentation for us uh, looks something like uh, one uh, particular screen. So imagine search or search results or the property details that you, that you see. Wait, have you guys ever used booking.com app? <laughs> Perfect. So uh, then uh, uh, the app services are some things that uh, different screens would share. So imagine a, a user account, right? Uh, you would need a user account to create a login screen and then probably to show some discounts and stuff like that. So it would keep uh, on flowing from screen to screen. That would go down into the app services. So other modules can have access to it. Or uh, an example that we'll, we'll see very soon uh, of user generated content, right? So it flows from the, from the very second screen of the app where you see search results. Uh, you see review scores and, and feedbacks of people, and then it goes all the way down to the funnel where you can actually know about the reviews of a particular room, how people felt when they lived there, right? So these are the things that are shared, which go under the app services uh, module. And then the third one is uh, core services, and core services are something that uh, you can actually reuse in other apps. So if you've written your networking layer, of course, you're not going to write OKHTTP again. But there could be wrappers around it that you have to inject your, your authentication things, your, your headers that you want, and localization, analytics, experimentation, these kind of things. You can also share across multiple projects or apps, right? They all go into the core services. A bit of an overview of uh, the modules that we have. So presentation, like I told you, looks something like as booking assistant, search, reservation, booking go. And then the modules, uh, look at the example so you get to, to get the feel of, of what it actually looks like. We have uh, genius components, UGC, UGC means user generated component, um, content, and prices, images, and all these things. Core services come down to commons, icon font, crash lyrics, and all these things. And then there are the foundations of, of Android that, that, is, uh, that provides us, on top of which we have some IQ stuff so that we don't write components over and over again for different screens. We just use our own internal library for the uh, interface quality. And this is how reusing the modules would look like. So if you have a UGC th uh, thing that you can use in multiple screens, uh, that's how you share, share stuff. So if you were to change something here, it would automatically get reflected in all the three screens there. Uh, there are some tools that we wrote to simplify. It's not something uh, very, uh, I mean, fancy. So because you would have to go on creating the new module, of course, you can do that in Android Studio, but it's not going to create all the configs for you, right? So you might have stuff that you've written for the main module. Um, for translations, for resources, lint cleanups, whatever. Uh, just make sure to write a simple shell script that we did, and it copies it to each and every module because it's going to be the same process every single time. Imagine you'd have to write uh, build.gradle every single time for, for your new module. Just uh, use these kind of things uh, that we did. Uh, apart from that, uh, find bugs uh, generate baseline. So every time you integrate find bugs, you guys know about find bugs, right? 
we're friends. Uh, so you would need to generate a baseline for a new module. Ideally, for every new module, this should be absolutely zero. So we're not going to tolerate any problem here, right? Uh, and then there's a really cool project called Android Dependency Visualizer. Uh, you can just see how big of a mess, not going to use that word, he's in here, uh, your app is now uh, just by using this thing, right? Uh, so solving fun, uh, funnel problems uh, for developers. Now, like I told you, the app has a lot of screens. And users, when they keep going down the funnel, uh, it becomes uh, difficult for developers uh, like us to test areas deep down the funnel, right? Uh, imagine you want to make a search. So if you want to test something in the reservation screen, every single time you open the app, you have to make a search. Uh, pick a, a result, right? Then pick a room and then fill in some info and make a reservation. Uh, so yeah, this is something that, that we have to deal with every single day. Modularization helps solve this problem in a very interesting way, right? Um, what it does is we have something called app start tests. They're not actually tests, but we leverage a UI test to hack uh, the system around. And uh, what we do is the idea is to deep link into a module. Because I told you in the beginning, if you have one entry and exit point, uh, in the module, you always know what you need to get into the module. So if you have all the dependencies defined, you can just get into that module, right? Uh, you can either do it either using real data or mock data, and then a uh, different set for different use cases that you have. Uh, and what the test uh, basically looks like is you would init your screen, your module, and then you would start the module, of course, and then you would tell the app to sleep like literally the, the just go thread.sleep for x number of days either in the emulator or or in the app now what happens is android thinks it's running an espresso ui test right actually it's not uh, we asked it to stop so because this thread is sleeping you can actually now interact with the app so uh, you can start the reservation screen uh, play around with it do whatever and you don't need to go through all the mess that we that we had before right and imagine this scenario, so if you're working on booking confirmation, if you change something anywhere there, it's only going to build the part of it that uh, depends on, on, on this thing, right? It's not going to build anything outside the dependency graph. So already, profit. You're able to omit a lot of the code that's not going to be built, right? Uh, a simple example is uh, these kind of tests that we have uh, to, to test the uh, booking go screen. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, this is... Fairly simple if you just tell the emulator to, hey, sleep. It's not going to do anything. So if you make it sleep for one day, yeah, it's not going to come back before a day. Of course, you're going to finish your testing session within two, three minutes. But yeah, that's how you tell uh, the guy to STFU. Uh, booking Go, this is uh, an example test. Uh, so this screen probably looks like uh, you booked a car or something. And then, yeah, just two minutes. Uh, you booked the car or something. So you don't have to go through all those steps. Uh, what you would ideally do is just uh, have uh, the test something like that and straight away get onto that screen. Similarly for payments, uh, we have these kind of tests where you want to test this screen. Again, you don't need to do all the hotel search and everything to, to come here. Uh, you could just write that test and do it. And to give you like an example, uh, the times came down from 25 seconds to 12, 28 to 13 uh, here. So it's almost 50% gain. And it's, it's really nice if you actually see it in action. And at booking scale, this is a, a, a big improvement. right? So yeah, uh, in the very end, I'd like to tell you what the advantages for you are here uh, is that it's much faster to develop the app. Um, it's easier to spot problems because like I told you, there's code isolation. You have less lines of code to deal with every single time. And you can have your own uh, SLAs in the modules, like find bugs, check style, how you like to maintain the code quality of the, of the code. And how can you do it? First, start by modularization. Uh, have fake or real activities that you want to mock. Create an app start test. And make the tests uh, depending on the types of feature you work on. So you can see if they're working fine or not. And that's going to be it. And by the way, modularization is not refactoring. Thank you so much.
We have a small gift for you, oh, uh, you. Google Home Mini. Oh, wow. I'm sure you can use it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Google is also one of the sponsors.